The Five Love Languages, The Secret to Love That Lasts By Gary Chapman Chapter 1 What Happens to Love After the Wedding At 30,000 feet, somewhere between Buffalo and Dallas, he put his magazine in his seat pocket, turned in my direction, and asked, What kind of work do you do? I do marriage counseling and lead marriage enrichment seminars, I said matter-of-factly. I've been wanting to ask someone this for a long time, he said. What happens to the love after you get married? Relinquishing my hopes of getting a nap, I asked, what do you mean? Well, he said, I've been married three times, and each time, it was wonderful before we got married, but somehow after the wedding it all fell apart. All the love I thought I had for her and the love she seemed to have for me evaporated. I am a fairly intelligent person. I operate a successful business, but I don't understand it. How long were you married? I asked. The first one lasted about ten years. The second time, we were married three years, and the last one, almost six years. Did your love evaporate immediately after the wedding, or was it a gradual loss? I inquired. Well, the second one went wrong from the very beginning. I don't know what happened. I really thought we loved each other, but the honeymoon was a disaster, and we never recovered. We only dated six months. It was a whirlwind romance. It was really exciting. But after the marriage, it was a battle from the beginning. In my first marriage, we had three or four good years before the baby came. After the baby was born, I felt like she gave her attention to the baby and I no longer mattered. It was as if her one goal in life was to have a baby, and after the baby, she no longer needed me. Did you tell her that? I asked. Yes, I told her. She said I was crazy. She said I did not understand the stress of being a 24-hour nurse. She said I should be more understanding and help her more. I really tried, but it didn't seem to make any difference. After that, we just grew further apart. After a while, there was no love left, just deadness. Both of us agreed that the marriage was over. My last marriage? I really thought that one would be different. I had been divorced for three years. We dated each other for two years, I really thought we knew what we were doing and I thought that perhaps for the first time I really knew what it meant to love someone. I genuinely felt that she loved me. After the wedding, I don't think I changed. I continued to express love to her as I had before marriage. I told her how beautiful she was. I told her how much I loved her. I told her how proud I was to be her husband. But a few months after marriage, she started complaining about petty things at first, like my not taking the garbage out or not hanging up my clothes. Later she went to attacking my character, telling me she didn't feel she could trust me, accusing me of not being faithful to her. She became a totally negative person. Before marriage, she was never negative. She was one of the most positive people I have ever met, that's one of the things that attracted me to her. She never complained about anything. Everything I did was wonderful, but once we were married, it seemed I could do nothing right. I honestly don't know what happened. Eventually, I lost my love for her and began to resent her. She obviously had no love for me, we agreed there was no benefit to our living together any longer, so we split, that was a year ago. So my question is, what happens to love after the wedding? Is my experience common? Is that why we have so many divorces in our country? I can't believe that it happened to me three times. And those who don't divorce, do they learn to live with the emptiness, or does love really stay alive in some marriages? If so, how? The questions my friend seated in 5A was asking are the questions that thousands of married and divorced persons are asking today. Some are asking friends, some are asking counselors and clergy, and some are asking themselves. Sometimes the answers are couched in psychological research jargon that is almost incomprehensible. Sometimes they are couched in humor and folklore. Most of the jokes and pithy sayings contain some truth, but they are like offering an aspirin to a person with cancer. The desire for romantic love in marriage is deeply rooted in our psychological makeup. Books abound on the subject. Television and radio talk shows deal with it. The internet is full of advice. So are our parents and friends. Keeping love alive in our marriages is serious business. With all the help available from media experts, why is it that so few couples seem to have found the secret to keeping love alive after the wedding? Why is it that a couple can attend a communication workshop, 
hear wonderful ideas on how to enhance communication, return home, and find themselves totally unable to implement the communication patterns demonstrated. How is it that we see an expert on Oprah share tips on 101 ways to express love to your spouse, select two or three ways that seem especially good to us, try them, and our spouse doesn't even acknowledge our effort, we give up on the other 98 ways and go back to life as usual. The truth we're missing. The answer to those questions is the purpose of this book. It is not that the books and articles already published are not helpful. The problem is that we have overlooked one fundamental truth, people speak different love languages. My academic training is in the area of anthropology. Therefore, I have studied in the area of linguistics, which identifies a number of major language groups, Japanese, Chinese, Spanish, English, Portuguese, Greek, German, French, and so on. Most of us grow up learning the language of our parents and siblings, which becomes our primary or native tongue. Later we may learn additional languages, but usually with much more effort. These become our secondary languages. We speak and understand best our native language. We feel most comfortable speaking that language. The more we use a secondary language, the more comfortable we become conversing in it. If we speak only our primary language and encounter someone else who speaks only his or her primary language, which is different from ours, our communication will be limited. We must rely on pointing, grunting, drawing pictures, or acting out our ideas. We can communicate, but it is awkward. Language differences are part and parcel of human culture. If we are to communicate effectively across cultural lines, we must learn the language of those with whom we wish to communicate. In the area of love, it is similar. Your emotional love language and the language of your spouse may be as different as Chinese from English. No matter how hard you try to express love in English, if your spouse understands only Chinese, you will never understand how to love each other. My friend on the plane was speaking the language of, affirming words, to his third wife when he said, I told her how beautiful she was. I told her I loved her. I told her how proud I was to be her husband. He was speaking love, and he was sincere, but she did not understand his language. Perhaps she was looking for love in his behavior and didn't see it. Being sincere is not enough. We must be willing to learn our spouse's primary love language if we are to be effective communicators of love. My conclusion after 30 years of marriage counseling is that there are five emotional love languages, five ways that people speak and understand emotional love. In the field of linguistics a language may have numerous dialects or variations. Similarly, within the five basic emotional love languages, there are many dialects. That accounts for the magazine articles titled, 10 Ways to Let Your Spouse Know You Love Her, 20 Ways to Keep Your Men at Home, or, 365 Expressions of Marital Love. There are not 10, 20, or 365 basic love languages. In my opinion, there are only 5. However, there may be numerous dialects. The number of ways to express love within a love language is limited only by one's imagination. The important thing is to speak the love language of your spouse. Seldom do a husband and wife have the same primary emotional love language. We tend to speak our primary love language, and we become confused when our spouse does not understand what we are communicating. We are expressing our love, but the message does not come through because we are speaking what, to them, is a foreign language. Therein lies the fundamental problem, and it is the purpose of this book to offer a solution. That is why I dare to write another book on love. Once we discover the five basic love languages and understand our own primary love language, as well as the primary love language of our spouse, we will then have the needed information to apply the ideas in the books and articles. Once you identify and learn to speak your spouse's primary love language, I believe that you will have discovered the key to a long-lasting, loving marriage. Love need not evaporate after the wedding, but in order to keep it alive most of us will have to put forth the effort to learn a secondary love language. We cannot rely on our native tongue if our spouse does not understand it. If we want them to feel the love we are trying to communicate, we must express it in his or her primary love language. Chapter 2. Keeping the Love Tank Full Love is the most important word in the English language, and the most confusing. Both secular and religious thinkers agree that love plays a central role in life. Thousands of books, songs, magazines, and movies are peppered with the word. Numerous philosophical and theological systems have made a prominent place for love. Psychologists have concluded that the need to feel loved is a primary human emotional need. 
For love, we will climb mountains, cross seas, traverse desert sands, and endure untold hardships. Without love, mountains become unclimbable, seas uncrossable, deserts unbearable, and hardships our lot in life. If we can agree that the word love permeates human society, both historically and in the present, we must also agree that it is a most confusing word. We use it in a thousand ways. We say, I love hot dogs, and in the next breath, I love my mother. We speak of loving activities, swimming, skiing, hunting. We love objects, food, cars, houses. We love animals, dogs, cats, even pet snails. We love nature, trees, grass, flowers, and weather. We love people, mother, father, son, daughter, wives, husbands, friends. We even fall in love with love. If all that is not confusing enough, we also use the word love to explain behavior. I did it because I love her. That explanation is given for all kinds of actions. A politician is involved in an adulterous relationship, and he calls it love. The preacher, on the other hand, calls it sin. The wife of an alcoholic picks up the pieces after her husband's latest episode. She calls it love, but the psychologist calls it codependency. The parent indulges all the child's wishes, calling it love, the family therapist would call it irresponsible parenting. What is loving behavior? The purpose of this book is not to eliminate all confusion surrounding the word love, but to focus on that kind of love that is essential to our emotional health. Child psychologists affirm that every child has certain basic emotional needs that must be met if he is to be emotionally stable. Among those emotional needs, none is more basic than the need for love and affection, the need to sense that he or she belongs and is wanted. With an adequate supply of affection, the child will likely develop into a responsible adult. Without that love, he or she will be emotionally and socially challenged. I liked the metaphor the first time I heard it, inside every child is an emotional tank waiting to be filled with love. When a child really feels loved, he will develop normally but when the love tank is empty, the child will misbehave. Much of the misbehavior of children is motivated by the cravings of an empty love tank. I was listening to Dr. Ross Campbell, a psychiatrist who specialized in the treatment of children and adolescents. As I listened, I thought of the hundreds of parents who had paraded the misdeeds of their children through my office. I had never visualized an empty love tank inside those children, but I had certainly seen the results of it. Their misbehavior was a misguided search for the love they did not feel. They were seeking love in all the wrong places and in all the wrong ways. I remember Ashley, who at 13 years of age was being treated for a sexually transmitted disease. Her parents were crushed. They were angry with Ashley. They were upset with the school, which they blamed for teaching her about sex. Why would she do this, they asked. In my conversation with Ashley, she told me of her parents' divorce when she was six years old. I thought my father left because he didn't love me, she said. When my mother remarried when I was 10, I felt she now had someone to love her, but I still had no one to love me. I wanted so much to be loved. I met this boy at school. He was older than me, but he liked me. I couldn't believe it. He was kind to me, and in a while I really felt he loved me. I didn't want to have sex, but I wanted to be loved. Ashley's love tank had been empty for many years. Her mother and stepfather had provided for her physical needs but had not realized the deep emotional struggle raging inside her. They certainly loved Ashley, and they thought that she felt their love. Not until it was almost too late did they discover that they were not speaking Ashley's primary love language. The emotional need for love, however, is not simply a childhood phenomenon. That need follows us into adulthood and into marriage. The in love experience temporarily meets that need, but it is inevitably a quick fix and as we shall learn later, has a limited and predictable lifespan. After we come down from the high of the in-love obsession, the emotional need for love resurfaces because it is fundamental to our nature. It is at the center of our emotional desires. We needed love before we fell in love, and we will need it as long as we live. The need to feel loved by one spouse is at the heart of marital desires. A man said to me recently, what good is the house, the cars, the place at the beach? or any of the rest of it if your wife doesn't love you. Do you understand what he was really saying? More than anything, I want to be loved by my wife. Material things are no replacement for human, emotional love. A wife says, he ignores me all day long and then wants to jump in bed with me. I hate it. 
she is not a wife who hates sex, she is a wife desperately pleading for emotional love. Our cry for love. Something in our nature cries out to be loved by another. Isolation is devastating to the human psyche, that is why solitary confinement is considered the cruelest of punishments. At the heart of humankind's existence is the desire to be intimate and to be loved by another. Marriage is designed to meet that need for intimacy and love. That is why the ancient biblical writings spoke of the husband and wife becoming one flesh. That did not mean that individuals would lose their identity, it meant that they would enter into each other's lives in a deep and intimate way. But if love is important, it is also elusive. I have listened to many married couples share their secret pain, some came to me because the inner ache had become unbearable. Others came because they realized that their behavior patterns or the misbehavior of their spouse was destroying the marriage. Some came simply to inform me that they no longer wanted to be married. Their dreams of living happily ever after had been dashed against the hard walls of reality. Again and again I have heard the words, our love is gone, our relationship is dead. We used to feel close, but not now. We no longer enjoy being with each other, we don't meet each other's needs. Their stories bear testimony that adults as well as children have love tanks. Could it be that deep inside hurting couples exists an invisible, emotional love tank, with its gauge on empty? Could the misbehavior, withdrawal, harsh words, and critical spirit occur because of that empty tank? If we could find a way to fill it, could the marriage be reborn? With a full tank would couples be able to create an emotional climate where it is possible to discuss differences and resolve conflicts? Could that tank be the key that makes marriage work? Those questions sent me on a long journey. Along the way, I discovered the simple yet powerful insights contained in this book. The journey has taken me not only through 30 years of marriage counseling but into the hearts and minds of hundreds of couples throughout America. From Seattle to Miami, couples have invited me into the inner chamber of their marriages, and we have talked openly. The illustrations included in this book are cut from the fabric of real life. Only names and places are changed to protect the privacy of the individuals who have spoken so freely. I am convinced that keeping the emotional love tank full is as important to a marriage as maintaining the proper oil level is to an automobile. Running your marriage on an empty love tank may cost you even more than trying to drive your car without oil. What you are about to read has the potential of saving thousands of marriages and can even enhance the emotional climate of a good marriage. Whatever the quality of your marriage now, it can always be better. Before we examine the five love languages, however, we must address one other important but confusing phenomenon, the euphoric experience of falling in love. Your turn. Has there ever been a time when you did something because you meant well? That is, out of loving motives. H. How did it turn out? Chapter 3. Falling in Love. She showed up at my office without an appointment and asked my secretary if she could see me for five minutes. I had known Janice for 18 years. She was 36 and had never married. From time to time, she had made appointments with me to discuss a particular difficulty in one of her dating relationships. She was by nature a conscientious, caring person, so it was completely out of character for her to show up at my office unannounced. I thought, T here must be some terrible crisis for Jay and East to come without an appointment. I told my assistant to show her in, and I fully expected to see her burst into tears and tell me some tragic story as soon as the door was closed. Instead, she practically skipped into my office, beaming with excitement. How are you today, Janice? I asked. Great, she said. I've never been better in my life. I'm getting married. You are. I said. To whom and when? To David Gillespie, she exclaimed, in September. That's exciting. How long have you been dating? Three weeks. I know it's crazy, Dr. Chapman, after all the people I have dated and the number of times I came so close to getting married. I can't believe it myself, but I know David is the one for me. From the first date, we both knew it. Of course, we didn't talk about it on the first night, but one week later, he asked me to marry him. I knew he was going to ask me, and I knew I was going to say yes. I have never felt this way before. You know about the relationships that I have had through the years and the struggles I have had. In every relationship, something was not right, I never felt at peace about marrying any of them, but I know that David is the right one. By this time, Janice was rocking back and forth in her chair, giggling, and saying, I know it's crazy, but I am so happy. 
I have never been this happy in my life. What has happened to Janice? She has fallen in love. In her mind, David is the most wonderful man she has ever met. He is perfect in every way. He will make the ideal husband. She thinks about him day and night. The facts that David has been married twice before, has three children, and has had three jobs in the past year are trivial to Janice. She's happy, and she is convinced that she is going to be happy forever with David. She is in love. Most of us enter marriage by way of the in-love experience. We meet someone whose physical characteristics and personality traits create enough electrical shock to trigger our love alert system. The bells go off, and we set in motion the process of getting to know the person. The first step may be sharing a hamburger or steak, depending on our budget, but our real interest is not in the food. We are on a quest to discover love. Could this warm, tingly feeling I have inside be the real thing? Sometimes we lose the tingles on the first date. We find out that he spends time on crackpot websites or she attended six colleges, and the tingles run right out of our toes, we want no more hamburgers with them. Other times, however, the tingles are stronger after the hamburger than before. We arrange for a few more together experiences, and before long the level of intensity has increased to the point where we find ourselves saying, I think I'm falling in love. Eventually we are convinced that it is the real thing, and we tell the other person, hoping the feeling is reciprocal. If it isn't, things cool off a bit or we redouble our efforts to impress, and eventually win the love of, our beloved. When it is reciprocal, we start talking about marriage because everyone agrees that being, in love, is the necessary foundation for a good marriage. The Anteroom of Heaven At its peak, the in-love experience is euphoric. We are emotionally obsessed with each other. We go to sleep thinking of one another. When we rise, that person is the first thought on our minds. We long to be together. Spending time together is like playing in the anteroom of heaven. When we hold hands, it seems as if our blood flows together. We could kiss forever if we didn't have to go to school or work. Embracing sparks dreams of marriage and ecstasy. The person who is in love, will call her Jen, has the illusion that her beloved is perfect. Her best friend can see the flaws, it bothers her how he talks to Jen sometimes, but Jen won't listen. Her mother. Noting the young man seems unable to hold a steady job, keeps her concerns to herself but asks polite questions about Ryan's plans. Our dreams before marriage are of marital bliss, we are going to make each other supremely happy. Other couples may argue and fight, but not us. We love each other. Of course, we are not totally naive. We know intellectually that we will eventually have differences. But we are certain that we will discuss those differences openly, one of us will always be willing to make concessions, and we will reach agreement. It's hard to believe anything else when you are in love. We have been led to believe that if we are really in love, it will last forever. We will always have the wonderful feelings that we have at this moment. Nothing could ever come between us. Nothing will ever overcome our love for each other. We are caught up in the beauty and charm of the other's personality. Our love is the most wonderful thing we have ever experienced. We observe that some married couples seem to have lost that feeling, but it will never happen to us. Maybe they didn't have the real thing, we reason. Unfortunately, the eternality of the in-love experience is fiction, not fact. The late psychologist Dr. Dorothy Tenev conducted long-range studies on the in-love phenomenon. After studying scores of couples, she concluded that the average lifespan of a romantic obsession is two years. If it is a secretive love affair, it may last a little longer. Eventually, however, we all descend from the clouds and plant our feet on earth again. Our eyes are opened, and we see the warts of the other person. Her quirks are now merely annoying. He shows a capacity for hurt and anger, perhaps even harsh words and critical judgments. Those little traits that we overlooked when we were in love now become huge mountains. Reality intrudes. Welcome to the real world of marriage, where hairs are always on the sink and little white spots cover the mirror, where arguments center on which way the toilet paper comes off and whether the lid should be up or down. It is a world where shoes do not walk to the closet and drawers do not close themselves, where coats do not like hangers and socks go AWOL during laundry. In this world, a look can hurt and a word can crush. Intimate lovers can become enemies, and marriage a battlefield. What happened to the in-love experience? Alas, it was but an illusion by which we were tricked into signing our names on the dotted line, for better or for worse. No wonder so many have come to curse marriage and the partner whom they once loved. 
after all, if we were deceived, we have a right to be angry. Did we really have the real thing? I think so. The problem was faulty information. The bad information was the idea that the in-love obsession would last forever. We should have known better. A casual observation should have taught us that if people remained obsessed, we would all be in serious trouble. The shock waves would rumble through business, industry, church, education, and the rest of society. Why? Because people who are in love lose interest in other pursuits. That is why we call it obsession. The college student who falls head over heels in love sees his grades tumbling. It is difficult to study when you are in love. Tomorrow you have a test on the War of 1812, but who cares about the War of 1812? When you're in love, everything else seems irrelevant. A man said to me, Dr. Chapman, my job is disintegrating. What do you mean? I asked. I met this girl, fell in love, and I can't get a thing done. I can't keep my mind on my job. I spend my day dreaming about her. The euphoria of the in-love state gives us the illusion that we have an intimate relationship. We feel that we belong to each other. We believe we can conquer all problems. We feel altruistic toward each other. As one young man said about his fiancée E, I can't conceive of doing anything to hurt her, my only desire is to make her happy. I would do anything to make her happy. Such obsession gives us the false sense that our egocentric attitudes have been eradicated and we have become sort of a mother. Teresa, willing to give anything for the benefit of our lover. The reason we can do that so freely is that we sincerely believe our lover feels the same way toward us. We believe that she is committed to meeting our needs, that he loves us as much as we love him and would never do anything to hurt us. That thinking is always fanciful, not that we are insincere in what we think and feel, but we are unrealistic. We fail to reckon with the reality of human nature. By nature, we are egocentric. Our world revolves around us. None of us is totally altruistic. The euphoria of the in-love experience only gives us that illusion. Once the experience of falling in love has run its natural course, remember, the average in-love experience lasts two years, we will return to the world of reality and begin to assert ourselves. He will express his desires, but his desires will be different from hers. He wants sex, but she is too tired. He dreams of buying a new car, but she flatly says, we can't afford it. She would like to visit her parents, but he says, I don't like spending so much time with your family. Little by little, the illusion of intimacy evaporates, and the individual desires, emotions, thoughts, and behavior patterns assert themselves. They are two individuals. Their minds have not melded together, and their emotions mingled only briefly in the ocean of love. Now the waves of reality begin to separate them. They fall out of love, and at that point either they withdraw, separate, divorce, and set off in search of a new in-love experience, or they begin the hard work of learning to love each other without the euphoria of the in-love obsession. Some couples believe that the end of the in-love experience means they have only two options, resign themselves to a life of misery with their spouse, or jump ship and try again. Our generation has opted for the latter, whereas an earlier generation often chose the former. Before we automatically conclude that we have made the better choice, perhaps we should examine the data. According to a substantial body of research, the divorce rate for second marriages is at least 60% and rises when children are involved. Point one. Research seems to indicate that there is a third and better alternative, we can recognize the in-love experience for what it was, a temporary emotional high, and now pursue real love with our spouse. That kind of love is emotional in nature but not obsessional. It is a love that unites reason and emotion. It involves an act of the will and requires discipline, and it recognizes the need for personal growth. Our most basic emotional need is not to fall in love but to be genuinely loved by another, to know a love that grows out of reason and choice, not instinct. I need to be loved by someone who chooses to love me, who sees in me something worth loving. That kind of love requires effort and discipline. It is the choice to expend energy in an effort to benefit the other person, knowing that if his or her life is enriched by your effort, you too will find a sense of satisfaction, the satisfaction of having genuinely loved another. It does not require the euphoria of the in-love experience. In fact, true love cannot begin until the in-love experience has run its course. We cannot take credit for the kind and generous things we do while under the influence of the obsession. We are pushed and carried along by an instinctual force that goes beyond our normal behavior patterns. 
but if, once we return to the real world of human choice, we choose to be kind and generous, that is real love. The emotional need for love must be met if we are to have emotional health. Married adults long to feel affection and love from their spouses. We feel secure when we are assured that our mate accepts us, wants us, and is committed to our well-being. During the in-love stage, we felt all of those emotions. It was heavenly while it lasted. Our mistake was in thinking it would last forever. But that obsession was not meant to last forever. In the textbook of marriage, it is but the introduction. The heart of the book is rational, volitional love. That is the kind of love to which the sages have always called us. It is intentional. That is good news to the married couple who have lost all of their in-love feelings. If love is a choice, then they have the capacity to love after the in-love obsession has died and they have returned to the real world. That kind of love begins with an attitude, a way of thinking. Love is the attitude that says, I am married to you, and I choose to look out for your interests. Then the one who chooses to love will find appropriate ways to express that decision. But it seems so sterile, some may contend. Love is an attitude with appropriate behavior. Where are the shooting stars, the balloons, the deep emotions? What about the spirit of anticipation, the twinkle of the eye, the electricity of a kiss, the excitement of sex? What about the emotional security of knowing that I am number one in his, her mind? That is what this book is all about. How do we meet each other's deep, emotional need to feel loved? If we can learn that and choose to do it, then the love we share will be exciting beyond anything we ever felt when we were infatuated. For many years now, I have discussed the five emotional love languages in my marriage seminars and in private counseling sessions. Thousands of couples will attest to the validity of what you are about to read. My files are filled with letters from people whom I have never met, saying, a friend loaned me one of your tapes on love languages, and it has revolutionized our marriage. We had struggled for years trying to love each other, but our efforts had missed each other emotionally. Now that we are speaking the appropriate love languages, the emotional climate of our marriage has radically improved. When your spouse's emotional love tank is full and he feels secure in your love, the whole world looks bright and your spouse will move out to reach his highest potential in life. But when the love tank is empty and he feels used but not loved, the whole world looks dark and he will likely never reach his potential for good in the world. In the next five chapters, I will explain the five emotional love languages and then, in chapter 9, illustrate how discovering your spouse's primary love language can make your efforts at love most productive. Your turn. Look back on that point in your marriage when reality set in and the initial romantic feelings faded. H. How did this affect your relationship, for better or worse? Chapter 4 Love Language Number 1 Words of Affirmation Mark Twain once said, I can live for two months on a good compliment. If we take Twain literally, six compliments a year would have kept his emotional love tank at the operational level. Your spouse will probably need more. One way to express love emotionally is to use words that build up. Solomon, author of the ancient Hebrew wisdom literature, wrote, The tongue has the power of life and death. Many couples have never learned the tremendous power of verbally affirming each other. Solomon further noted, An anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. Verbal compliments, or words of appreciation, are powerful communicators of love. They are best expressed in simple, straightforward statements of affirmation, such as You look sharp in that suit. Do you ever look hot in that dress? Wow! I really like how you're always on time to pick me up at work. Thanks for getting the babysitter lined up tonight. I want you to know I don't take that for granted. I love how you are so responsible. I feel like I can count on you. What would happen to the emotional climate of a marriage if the husband and wife heard such words of affirmation regularly? Several years ago, I was sitting in my office with my door open. A lady walking down the hall said, Have you got a minute? Sure, come in. She sat down and said, Dr. Chapman, I've got a problem. I can't get my husband to paint our bedroom. I have been after him for nine months. I have tried everything I know, and I can't get him to paint it. My first thought was, Lady, you are at the wrong place. I am not a paint contractor. But I said, tell me about it. She said, well, last Saturday was a good example. You remember how pretty it was? Do you know what my husband did all day long? He worked on updating his computer. 
So what did you do? I went in there and said, Dan, I don't understand you. Today would have been a perfect day to paint the bedroom, and here you are working on your computer. So did he paint the bedroom? I inquired. No. It's still not painted. I don't know what to do. Let me ask you a question, I said. Are you opposed to computers? No, but I want the bedroom painted. Are you certain that your husband knows that you want the bedroom painted? I know he does, she said. I have been after him for nine months. Let me ask you one more question. Does your husband ever do anything good? Like what? Oh, like taking the garbage out, or getting bugs off the windshield of the car you drive, or putting gas in the car, or paying the electric bill, or hanging up his coat. Yes, she said, he does some of those things. Then I have two suggestions. 1. Don't ever mention painting the bedroom again. I repeated, don't ever mention it again. I don't see how that's going to help, she said. Look, you just told me that he knows that you want the bedroom painted. You don't have to tell him anymore. He already knows. The second suggestion I have is that the next time your husband does anything good, give him a verbal compliment. If he takes the garbage out, say, Dan, I want you to know that I really appreciate your taking the garbage out. Don't say, about time you took the garbage out, the flies were going to carry it out for you. If you see him paying the electric bill, put your hand on his shoulder and say, Dan, I really appreciate your paying the electric bill. I hear there are husbands who don't do that, and I want you to know how much I appreciate it. Or, I really appreciated you taking the kids off my hands when I had to finish the project. Every time he does anything good, give him a verbal compliment. I don't see how that's going to get the bedroom painted. I said, you asked for my advice. You have it. It's free, she wasn't very happy with me when she left. Three weeks later, however, she came back to my office and said, it worked. She had learned that verbal compliments are far greater motivators than nagging words. I am not suggesting verbal flattery in order to get your spouse to do something you want. The object of love is not getting something you want but doing something for the well-being of the one you love. It is a fact, however, that when we receive affirming words we are far more likely to be motivated to reciprocate and do something our spouse desires. Encouraging words, giving verbal compliments is only one way to express words of affirmation to your spouse. Another dialect is encouraging words. The word encourage means, to inspire courage. All of us have areas in which we feel insecure. We lack courage, and that lack of courage often hinders us from accomplishing the positive things that we would like to do. The latent potential within your spouse in his or her areas of insecurity may await your encouraging words. Allison had always liked to write. Late in her college career, she took a few courses in journalism. She quickly realized that her excitement about writing exceeded her interest in history, which had been her academic major. It was too late to change majors, but after college and especially before the first baby, she wrote several articles. She submitted one article to a magazine, but when she received a rejection slip, she never had the courage to submit another. Now that the children were older and she had more time to contemplate, Allison was again writing. Keith, Allison's husband, had paid little attention to Allison's writing in the early days of their marriage. He was busy with his own vocation and caught up in the pressure of climbing the corporate ladder. In time, however, Keith had realized that life's deepest meaning is not found in accomplishments but in relationships. He had learned to give more attention to Allison and her interests. So it was quite natural one night for him to pick up one of Allison's articles and read it. When he finished, he went into the den where Allison was reading a book. With great enthusiasm, he said, I hate to interrupt your reading, but I have to tell you this. I just finished reading your article on making the most of the holidays. Allison, you are an excellent writer. This stuff ought to be published. You write clearly. Your words paint pictures that I can visualize. You have a fascinating style. You have to submit this stuff to some magazines. Do you really think so? Allison asked hesitantly. I know so, Keith said. I'm telling you, this is good. When Keith left the room, Allison did not resume her reading. With the closed book in her lap, she dreamed for thirty minutes about what Keith had said. She wondered if others would view her writing the same way he did. She remembered the rejection slip she had received years before, but she reasoned that she was a different person now. Her writing was better. 
she had had more experiences. Before she left the chair to get a drink of water, Allison had made a decision. She would submit her articles to some magazines. She would see if they could be published. Keith's encouraging words were spoken many years ago. Allison has had numerous articles published since then and now has a book contract. She is an excellent writer, but it took the encouraging words from her husband to inspire her to take the first step in the arduous process of getting an article published. Perhaps your spouse has untapped potential in one or more areas of life. That potential may be awaiting your encouraging words. Perhaps she needs to enroll in a course to develop that potential. Maybe he needs to meet some people who have succeeded in that area, who can give him insight on the next step he needs to take. Your words may give your spouse the courage necessary to take that first step. Please note that I am not talking about pressuring your spouse to do something that you want. I am talking about encouraging him to develop an interest that he already has. For example, a wife might pressure her husband to look for a more lucrative job. The wife thinks she's encouraging her spouse, but to him it sounds more like condemnation. But if he has the desire and motivation to seek a better position, her words will bolster his resolve. Until he has that desire, her words will come across as judgmental and guilt-inducing. They express not love but rejection. If, however, he says, you know, I've been thinking about starting a handyman business on the side, then she has opportunity to give words of encouragement. Encouraging words would sound like this, if you decide to do that, I can tell you one thing. You will be a success. That's one of the things I like about you. When you set your mind to something, you do it. If that's what you want to do, I will certainly do everything I can to help you. Such words may give him the courage to start drawing up a list of potential clients. Encouragement requires empathy and seeing the world from your spouse's perspective. We must first learn what is important to our spouse. Only then can we give encouragement. With verbal encouragement, we are trying to communicate, I know. I care. I am with you. How can I help? We are trying to show that we believe in him and in his abilities. We are giving credit and praise. Most of us have more potential than we will ever develop. What holds us back is often a lack of courage. A loving spouse can supply that all, important catalyst. Of course, encouraging words may be difficult for you to speak. It may not be your primary love language. It may take great effort for you to learn the second language. That will be especially true if you have a pattern of critical and condemning words, but I can assure you that it will be worth the effort. Kind words. Love is kind. If then we are to communicate love verbally, we must use kind words. That has to do with the way we speak. The same sentence can have two different meanings, depending on how you say it. The statement, I love you, when said with kindness and tenderness, can be a genuine expression of love. But what about, I love you? The question mark changes the whole meaning of those three words. Sometimes our words say one thing, but our tone of voice says another. We are sending double messages. Our spouse will usually interpret our message based on our tone of voice, not the words we use. I would be delighted to wash dishes tonight, said in a snarling tone will not be received as an expression of love. On the other hand, we can share hurt, pain, and even anger in a kind manner, and that will be an expression of love. I felt disappointed and hurt that you didn't offer to help me this evening, said in an honest, kind manner can be an expression of love. The person speaking wants to be known by her spouse. She is taking steps to build intimacy by sharing her feelings. She is asking for an opportunity to discuss a hurt in order to find healing. The same words expressed with a loud, harsh voice will be not an expression of love but an expression of condemnation and judgment. The manner in which we speak is exceedingly important. An ancient sage once said, a soft answer turns away anger. When your spouse is angry and upset and lashing out with words of heat, if you choose to be loving, you will not reciprocate with additional heat but with a soft voice. You will receive what he is saying as information about his emotional feelings. You will let him tell you of his hurt, anger, and perception of events. You will seek to put yourself in his shoes and see the event through his eyes and then express softly and kindly your understanding of why he feels that way. If you have wronged him, you will be willing to confess the wrong and ask forgiveness. If your motivation is different from what he is reading, you will be able to explain your motivation kindly. You will seek understanding and reconciliation, and not to prove your own perception as the only logical way to interpret what has happened. That is mature love, love to which we aspire if we seek a growing marriage. Love doesn't keep a score of wrongs. Love doesn't bring up past failures. 
none of us is perfect. In marriage we do not always do the best or right thing. We have sometimes done and said hurtful things to our spouses. We cannot erase the past. We can only confess it and agree that it was wrong. We can ask for forgiveness and try to act differently in the future. Having confessed my failure and asked forgiveness, I can do nothing more to mitigate the hurt it may have caused my spouse. When I have been wronged by my spouse and she has painfully confessed it and requested forgiveness, I have the option of justice or forgiveness. If I choose justice and seek to pay her back or make her pay for her wrongdoing, I am making myself the judge and she the felon. Intimacy becomes impossible. If, however, I choose to forgive, intimacy can be restored. Forgiveness is the way of love. I am amazed by how many individuals mess up every new day with yesterday. They insist on bringing into today the failures of yesterday and in so doing, they pollute a potentially wonderful day. I can't believe you did it. I don't think I'll ever forget it. You can't possibly know how much you hurt me. I don't know how you can sit there so smugly after you treated me that way. You ought to be crawling on your knees, begging me for forgiveness. I don't know if I can ever forgive you. Those are not the words of love but of bitterness and resentment and revenge. The best thing we can do with the failures of the past is to let them be history. Yes, it happened. Certainly it hurt. And it may still hurt, but he has acknowledged his failure and asked your forgiveness. We cannot erase the past, but we can accept it as history. We can choose to live today free from the failures of yesterday. Forgiveness is not a feeling, it is a commitment. It is a choice to show mercy, not to hold the offense up against the offender. Forgiveness is an expression of love. I love you. I care about you, and I choose to forgive you. Even though my feelings of hurt may linger, I will not allow what has happened to come between us. I hope that we can learn from this experience. You are not a failure because you have failed. You are my spouse, and together we will go on from here. Those are the words of affirmation expressed in the dialect of kind words. Humble words. Love makes requests, not demands. When I demand things from my spouse, I become a parent and she the child. It is the parent who tells the three-year-old what he ought to do and, in fact, what he must do. That is necessary because the three-year-old does not yet know how to navigate in the treacherous waters of life. In marriage, however, we are equal, adult partners. We are not perfect to be sure, but we are adults and we are partners. If we are to develop an intimate relationship, we need to know each other's desires. If we wish to love each other, we need to know what the other person wants. The way we express those desires, however, is all important. If they come across as demands, we have erased the possibility of intimacy and will drive our spouse away. If, however, we make our needs and desires known in the form of a request, we are giving guidance, not ultimatums. The husband who says, could you make that good pasta one of these nights, is giving his wife guidance on how to love him and thus build intimacy. On the other hand, the husband who says, can't we ever have a decent meal around here, is being adolescent, is making a demand, and his wife is likely to fire back, okay, you cook. The wife who says, do you think it will be possible for you to clean the gutters this weekend, is expressing love by making a request. But the wife who says, if you don't get those gutters cleaned out soon, they are going to fall off the house. They already have trees growing out of them, has ceased to love and has become a domineering spouse. When you make a request of your spouse, you are affirming his or her worth and abilities. You are in essence indicating that she has something or can do something that is meaningful and worthwhile to you. When, however, you make demands, you have become not a lover but a tyrant. Your spouse will feel not affirmed but belittled. A request introduces the element of choice. Your mate may choose to respond to your request or to deny it, because love is always a choice. That's what makes it meaningful. To know that my spouse loves me enough to respond to one of my requests communicates emotionally that she cares about me, respects me, admires me, and wants to do something to please me. We cannot get emotional love by way of demand. My spouse may in fact comply with my demands, but it is not an expression of love. It is an act of fear or guilt or some other emotion, but not love. Thus, a request creates the possibility for an expression of love, whereas a demand suffocates that possibility. More ways to affirm. Words of affirmation is one of the five basic love languages. Within that language, however, there are many dialects. We have discussed a few already, and there are many more. Entire volumes and numerous articles have been written on these dialects. 
All of the dialects have in common the use of words to affirm one's spouse. Psychologist William James said that possibly the deepest human need is the need to feel appreciated. Words of affirmation will meet that need in many individuals. If you are not a man or woman of words, if it is not your primary love language but you think it may be the love language of your spouse, let me suggest that you keep a notebook titled, Words of Affirmation. When you read an article or book on love, record the words of affirmation you find. When you hear a lecture on love or you overhear a friend saying something positive about another person, write it down. In time, you will collect quite a list of words to use in communicating love to your spouse. You may also want to try giving indirect words of affirmation, that is, saying positive things about your spouse when he or she is not present. Eventually, someone will tell your spouse, and you will get full credit for love. Tell your wife's mother how great your wife is. When her mother tells her what you said, it will be amplified, and you will get even more credit. Also affirm your spouse in front of others when he or she is present. When you are given public honor for an accomplishment, be sure to share the credit with your spouse. You may also try your hand at writing words of affirmation. Written words have the benefit of being read over and over again. I learned an important lesson about words of affirmation and love languages years ago in Little Rock, Arkansas. My visit with Bill and Betty Jo was on a beautiful spring day. They lived in a cluster home with white picket fence, green grass, and spring flowers in full bloom. It was idyllic. Once inside, however, I discovered that the idealism ended. Their marriage was in shambles. Twelve years and two children after the wedding day, they wondered why they had married in the first place. They seemed to disagree on everything, the only thing they really agreed on was that they both loved the children. As the story unfolded, my observation was that Bill was a workaholic who had little time left over for Betty Jo. Betty Jo worked part-time, mainly to get out of the house. Their method of coping was withdrawal. They tried to put distance between each other so that their conflicts would not seem as large. But the gauge on both love tanks read, empty. They told me that they had been going for marriage counseling but didn't seem to be making much progress. They were attending my marriage seminar, and I was leaving town the next day. This would likely be my only encounter with Bill and Betty Jo. I decided to put everything on the table. I spent an hour with each of them separately. I listened intently to both stories. I discovered that in spite of the emptiness of their relationship and their many disagreements, they appreciated certain things about each other. Bill acknowledged, she is a good mother. She also is a good housekeeper and an excellent cook when she chooses to cook. But, he continued, there is simply no affection coming from her, I work my tail off and there is simply no appreciation. In my conversation with Betty Jo, she agreed that Bill was an excellent provider. But, she complained, he does nothing around the house to help me, and he never has time for me. What's the use of having the house, the recreational vehicle, and all the other things if you don't ever get to enjoy them together? With that information, I decided to focus my advice by making only one suggestion to each of them. I told Bill and Betty Jo separately that each one held the key to changing the emotional climate of the marriage. That key, I said, is to express verbal appreciation for the things you like about the other person and, for the moment, suspending your complaints about the things you do not like. We reviewed the positive comments they had already made about each other and I helped each of them write a list of those positive traits. Bill's list focused on Betty Jo's activities as a mother, housekeeper, and cook. Betty Jo's list focused on Bill's hard work and financial provision for the family. We made the lists as specific as possible. Betty Jo's list looked like this. He hasn't missed a day of work in 12 years. He is aggressive in his work. He has received several promotions through the years. He is always thinking of ways to improve his productivity. He makes the house payment each month. He's a good financial manager. He bought us a recreational vehicle three years ago. He keeps up with the yard work or hires someone to do it. He is generous with finances. He takes the garbage out once a month. He agrees that I can use the money for my part-time job any way I desire. Bill's list looked like this. She makes the beds every day. She keeps our house clean and orderly. She gets the kids off to school every morning with a good breakfast. She cooks dinner about three days a week. She buys the groceries. She helps the children with their homework. She transports the children to school and church activities. She teaches first grade Sunday school. She takes my clothes to the cleaners. 
I suggested that they add to the lists things they noticed in the weeks ahead. I also suggested that twice a week, they select one positive trait and express verbal appreciation for it to the spouse. I gave one further guideline. I told Betty Jo that if Bill happened to give her a compliment, she was not to give him a compliment at the same time, but rather she should simply receive it and say, thank you for saying that. I told Bill the same thing. I encouraged them to do that every week for two months, and if they found it helpful, they could continue. If the experiment did not help the emotional climate of the marriage, then they could write it off as another failed attempt. The next day, I got on the plane and returned home. I made a note to call Bill and Betty Joe two months later to see what had happened. When I called them in midsummer, I asked to speak to each of them individually. I was amazed to find that Bill's attitude had taken a giant step forward. He had guessed that I had given Betty Joe the same advice I had given him, but that was all right. He loved it. She was expressing appreciation for his hard work and his provision for the family. She has actually made me feel like a man again. We've got a ways to go, Dr. Chapman, but I really believe we are on the road. When I talked to Betty Jo, however, I found that she had only taken a baby step forward. She said, it has improved some, Dr. Chapman. Bill is giving me verbal compliments as you suggested, and I guess he is sincere. But he's still not spending any time with me. He is still so busy at work that we never have time together. As I listened to Betty Jo, I knew that I had made a significant discovery. The love language of one person is not necessarily the love language of another. It was obvious that Bill's primary love language was words of affirmation. He was a hard worker, and he enjoyed his work, but what he wanted most from his wife was expressions of appreciation for his work. That pattern was probably set in childhood, and the need for verbal affirmation was no less important in his adult life. Betty Jo, on the other hand, was emotionally crying out for something else. That brings us to love language number two. Your turn, share instances with your spouse when words had a profound impact on your life. Positively or negatively. 1. To remind yourself that, words of affirmation, is your spouse's primary love language, print the following on a 3x5 card and put it on a mirror or other place where you will see it daily. Words are important. Words are important. Words are important. 2. For one week, keep a written record of all the words of affirmation you give your spouse each day. On Monday, I said. You did a great job on this meal. You really look nice in that outfit. I appreciate your picking up the dry cleaning. On Tuesday, I said, etc. You might be surprised how well, or how poorly, you are speaking words of affirmation. 3. Set a goal to give your spouse a different compliment each day for one month. If an apple a day keeps the doctor away, maybe a compliment a day will keep the counselor away. You may want to record these compliments also, so you will not duplicate the statements. 4. As you watch TV, read, or listen to people's conversations, look for words of affirmation that people use. Write those affirming statements in a notebook or keep them electronically. Read through these periodically and select those you could use with your spouse. When you use one, note the date on which you used it. Your notebook may become your love book. Remember, words are important. 5. Write a love letter, a love paragraph, or a love sentence to your spouse, and give it quietly or with fanfare. You may someday find your love letter tucked away in some special place. Words are important. 6. Compliment your spouse in the presence of his parents or friends. You will get double credit, your spouse will feel loved and the parents will feel lucky to have such a great son-in-law or daughter-in-law. 7. Look for your spouse's strengths and tell her how much you appreciate those strengths. Chances are she will work hard to live up to her reputation. 8. Tell your children how great their mother or father is. Do this behind your spouse's back and in her presence. Chapter 5. Love Language Number 2. Quality Time. I should have picked up on Betty Jo's primary love language from the beginning. What was she saying on that spring day when I visited her and Bill in Little Rock? Bill is a good provider, but he doesn't spend any time with me. What good are all our things if we don't ever enjoy them together? What was her desire? Quality time with Bill. She wanted his attention. She wanted him to focus on her, to give her time, to do things with her. By, quality time, I mean giving someone your undivided attention. I don't mean sitting on the couch watching television together. 
When you spend time that way, ABC or NBC has your attention, not your spouse. What I mean is sitting on the couch with the TV off, looking at each other and talking, giving each other your undivided attention. It means taking a walk, just the two of you, or going out to eat and looking at each other and talking. Have you ever noticed that in a restaurant, you can almost always tell the difference between a dating couple and a married couple? Dating couples look at each other and talk. Married couples sit there and gaze around the restaurant. You'd think they went there to eat. When I sit with my wife and give her 20 minutes of my undivided attention and she does the same for me, we are giving each other 20 minutes of life. We will never have those 20 minutes again, we are giving our lives to each other. It is a powerful emotional communicator of love. One medicine cannot cure all diseases. In my advice to Bill and Betty Jo, I made a serious mistake. I assumed that words of affirmation would mean as much to Betty Jo as they would to Bill. I had hoped that if each of them would give adequate verbal affirmation, the emotional climate would change, and both of them would begin to feel loved. It worked for Bill. He began to feel more positive about Betty Jo. He began to sense genuine appreciation for his hard work, but it had not worked as well for Betty Jo, for words of affirmation was not her primary love language. Her language was quality time. I got back on the phone and thanked Bill for his efforts in the past two months. I told him that he had done a good job of verbally affirming Betty Jo and that she had heard his affirmations. But, Dr. Chapman, he said, she is still not very happy. I don't think things are much better for her. You are right, I said, and I think I know why. The problem is that I suggested the wrong love language. Bill hadn't the foggiest idea what I meant. I explained that what makes one person feel loved emotionally is not always the thing that makes another person feel loved emotionally. He agreed that his language was words of affirmation. He told me how much that had meant to him as a boy and how good he felt when Betty Jo expressed appreciation for the things he did. I explained that Betty Jo's language was not words of affirmation but quality time. I explained the concept of giving someone your undivided attention, not talking to her while you read the newspaper or watch television but looking into her eyes, giving her your full attention, doing something with her that she enjoys doing and doing it wholeheartedly. Like going to the symphony with her, he said. I could tell the lights were coming on in Little Rock. Dr. Chapman, that is what she has always complained about. I didn't do things with her, I didn't spend any time with her. We used to go places and do things before we were married, she said, but now, you're too busy. That's her love language all right, no question about it. But what am I gonna do? My job is so demanding. Tell me about it, I said. For the next ten minutes, he gave me the history of his climb up the organizational ladder, of how hard he had worked, and how proud he was of his accomplishments. He told me of his dreams for the future and that he knew that within the next five years, he would be where he wanted to be. Do you want to be there alone, or do you want to be there with Betty Jo and the children? I asked. I want her to be with me, Dr. Chapman. I want her to enjoy it with me. That's why it always hurts so much when she criticizes me for spending time on the job. I am doing it for us. I wanted her to be a part of it, but she is always so negative. Are you beginning to see why she is so negative, Bill? I asked. Her love language is quality time. You have given her so little time that her love tank is empty. She doesn't feel secure in your love. Therefore she has lashed out at what was taking your time in her mind, your job. She doesn't really hate your job. She hates the fact that she feels so little love coming from you. There's only one answer, Bill, and it's costly. You have to make time for Betty Jo. You have to love her in the right love language. I know you are right, Dr. Chapman. Where do I begin? Do you have your legal pad handy? The one on which we made the list of the positive things about Betty Jo. It's right here. Good. We're going to make another list. What are some things that you know Betty Jo would like you to do with her? Things she has mentioned through the years. Here is Bill's list. Spend weekends in the mountains, sometimes with the children and sometimes just the two of us. Meet her for lunch, at a nice restaurant or sometimes even at McDonald's. Get a babysitter and take her out to dinner, just the two of us. When I come home at night, sit down and talk with her about my day and listen as she tells me about her day. She doesn't want me to watch TV while we are trying to talk. Spend time talking with the children about their school experiences. Spend time playing games with the children. Go on a picnic with her and the children on Saturday and don't complain about the ants and the flies. 
Take a vacation with the family at least once a year. Go walking with her and talk as we walk. Those are the things she has talked about through the years, he said. You know what I am going to suggest, don't you, Bill? Do them, he said. That's right, one a week for the next two months. Where will you find the time? You will make it. You are a wise man, I continued. You would not be where you are if you were not a good decision maker. You have the ability to plan your life and to include Betty Jo in your plans. I know, he said. I can do it. And, Bill, this does not have to diminish your vocational goals. It just means that when you get to the top, Betty Jo and the children will be with you. That's what I want more than anything. Whether I am at the top or not, I want her to be happy, and I want to enjoy life with her and the children. The years have come and gone. Bill and Betty Jo have gone to the top and back, but the important thing is that they have done it together. The children have left the nest, and Bill and Betty Jo agree that these are their best years ever. Bill has become an avid symphony fan, and Betty Jo has made an unending list in her legal pad of things she appreciates about Bill. He never tires of hearing them. He has now started his own company and is near the top again, his job is no longer a threat to Betty Jo. She is excited about it and encourages him. She knows that she is number one in his life. Her love tank is full, and if it begins to get empty, she knows that a simple request on her part will get Bill's undivided attention. Focused attention. It isn't enough to just be in the same room with someone. A key ingredient in giving your spouse quality time is giving them focused attention, especially in this era of many distractions. When a father is sitting on the floor, rolling a ball to his two-year-old, his attention is not focused on the ball but on his child. For that brief moment, however long it lasts, they are together. If, however, the father is talking on the phone while he rolls the ball, his attention is diluted. Some husbands and wives think they are spending time together when, in reality, they are only living in close proximity. They are in the same house at the same time, but they are not together. A wife who is texting while her husband tries to talk to her is not giving him quality time, because he does not have her full attention. Quality time does not mean that we have to spend our together moments gazing into each other's eyes. It means that we are doing something together and that we are giving our full attention to the other person. The activity in which we are both engaged is incidental. The important thing emotionally is that we are spending focused time with each other. The activity is a vehicle that creates the sense of togetherness. The important thing about the father rolling the ball to the two-year-old is not the activity itself, but the emotions that are created between the father and his child. Similarly, a husband and wife playing tennis together, if it is genuine quality time, will focus not on the game but on the fact that they are spending time together. What happens on the emotional level is what matters. Our spending time together in a common pursuit communicates that we care about each other, that we enjoy being with each other, that we like to do things together. Quality Conversation Like words of affirmation, the language of quality time also has many dialects. One of the most common dialects is that of quality conversation. By quality conversation, I mean sympathetic dialogue where two individuals are sharing their experiences, thoughts, feelings, and desires in a friendly, uninterrupted context. Most individuals who complain that their spouse does not talk do not mean literally that he or she never says a word. They mean that he or she seldom takes part in sympathetic dialogue. If your spouse's primary love language is quality time, such dialogue is crucial to his or her emotional sense of being loved. Quality conversation is quite different from the first love language. Words of affirmation focus on what we are saying, whereas quality conversation focuses on what we are hearing. If I am sharing my love for you by means of quality time and we are going to spend that time in conversation, it means I will focus on drawing you out, listening sympathetically to what you have to say. I will ask questions, not in a badgering manner but with a genuine desire to understand your thoughts, feelings, and hopes. I met Patrick when he was 43 and had been married for 17 years. I remember him because his first words were so dramatic. He sat in the leather chair in my office and after briefly introducing himself, he leaned forward and said with great emotion, Dr. Chapman, I have been a fool, a real fool. What has led you to that conclusion? I asked. I've been married for 17 years, he said, and my wife has left me. Now I realize what a fool I've been. I repeated my original question, in what way have you been a fool? My wife would come home from work and tell me about the problems in her office. I would listen to her and then tell her what I thought she should do. I always gave her advice. 
I told her she had to confront the problem. Problems don't go away. You have to talk with the people involved or your supervisor. You have to deal with problems. The next day she would come home from work and tell me about the same problems. I would ask her if she did what I had suggested the day before. She would shake her head and say no, so I'd repeat my advice. I told her that was the way to deal with the situation. She would come home the next day and tell me about the same problems. Again I would ask her if she had done what I had suggested. She would shake her head and say no. After three or four nights of that, I would get angry. I would tell her not to expect any sympathy from me if she wasn't willing to take the advice I was giving her. She didn't have to live under that kind of stress and pressure. She could solve the problem if she would simply do what I told her. It hurt me to see her living under such stress because I knew she didn't have to. The next time she'd bring up the problem, I would say, I don't want to hear about it. I've told you what you need to do. If you're not going to listen to my advice, I don't want to hear it. I would withdraw and go about my business. Now I realize that she didn't want advice when she told me about her struggles at work. She wanted sympathy. She wanted me to listen, to give her attention, to let her know that I could understand the hurt, the stress, the pressure. She wanted to know that I loved her and that I was with her. She didn't want advice, she just wanted to know that I understood. But I never tried to understand. I was too busy giving advice. And now she is gone. Why can't you see these things when you are going through them, he asked. I was blind to what was going on. Only now do I understand how I failed her. Patrick's wife had been pleading for quality conversation. Emotionally, she longed for him to focus attention on her by listening to her pain and frustration. Patrick was not focusing on listening but on speaking. He listened only long enough to hear the problem and formulate a solution. He didn't listen long enough or well enough to hear her cry for support and understanding. Many of us are like Patrick. We are trained to analyze problems and create solutions. We forget that marriage is a relationship, not a project to be completed or a problem to solve. A relationship calls for sympathetic listening with a view to understanding the other person's thoughts, feelings, and desires. We must be willing to give advice but only when it is requested and never in a condescending manner. Most of us have little training in listening. We are far more efficient in thinking and speaking. Learning to listen may be as difficult as learning a foreign language, but learn we must, if we want to communicate love. That is especially true if your spouse's primary love language is quality time and his or her dialect is quality conversation. Fortunately, numerous books and articles have been written on developing the art of listening. I will not seek to repeat what is written elsewhere but suggest the following summary of practical tips. 1. Maintain eye contact when your spouse is talking. That keeps your mind from wandering and communicates that he, she has your full attention. 2. Don't listen to your spouse and do something else at the same time. Remember, quality time is giving someone your undivided attention. If you are doing something you cannot turn from immediately, tell your spouse the truth. A positive approach might be, I know you are trying to talk to me and I'm interested, but I want to give you my full attention. I can't do that right now, but if you will give me 10 minutes to finish this, I'll sit down and listen to you. Most spouses will respect such a request. 3. Listen for feelings. Ask yourself, what emotion is my spouse experiencing? When you think you have the answer, confirm it. For example, it sounds to me like you are feeling disappointed because I forgot underscore 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 underscore. That gives him the chance to clarify his feelings. It also communicates that you are listening intently to what he is saying. 4. Observe body language. Clenched fists, trembling hands, tears, furrowed brows, and eye movement may give you clues as to what the other is feeling. Sometimes body language speaks one message while words speak another. Ask for clarification to make sure you know what she is really thinking and feeling. 5. Refuse to interrupt. Recent research has indicated that the average individual listens for only 17 seconds before interrupting and interjecting his own ideas. If I give you my undivided attention while you are talking, I will refrain from defending myself or hurling accusations at you or dogmatically stating my position. My goal is to discover your thoughts and feelings. My objective is not to defend myself or to set you straight. It is to understand you. Learning to talk. Quality conversation requires not only sympathetic listening but also self-revelation. When a wife says, I wish my husband would talk. 
I never know what he's thinking or feeling, she is pleading for intimacy. She wants to feel close to her husband, but how can she feel close to someone whom she doesn't know? In order for her to feel loved, he must learn to reveal himself. If her primary love language is quality time and her dialect is quality conversation, her emotional love tank will never be filled until he tells her his thoughts and feelings. Self-revelation does not come easy for some of us. Many adults grew up in homes where the expression of thoughts and feelings was not encouraged but condemned. To request a toy was to receive a lecture on the sad state of family finances. The child went away feeling guilty for having the desire, and he quickly learned not to express his desires. When he expressed anger, the parents responded with harsh and condemning words. Thus, the child learned that expressing angry feelings is not appropriate. If the child was made to feel guilty for expressing disappointment at not being able to go to the store with his father, he learned to hold his disappointment inside. By the time we reach adulthood, many of us have learned to deny our feelings. We are no longer in touch with our emotional selves. A wife says to her husband, How did you feel about what Steve did? And the husband responds, I think he was wrong. He should have, but he is not telling her his feelings. He is voicing his thoughts. Perhaps he has reason to feel angry, hurt, or disappointed, but he has lived so long in the world of thought that he does not acknowledge his feelings. When he decides to learn the language of quality conversation, it will be like learning a foreign language. The place to begin is by getting in touch with his feelings, becoming aware that he is an emotional creature in spite of the fact that he has denied that part of his life. If you need to learn the language of quality conversation, begin by noting the emotions you feel away from home. Carry a small notepad and keep it with you daily. Three times each day, ask yourself, what emotions have I felt in the last three hours? What did I feel on the way to work when the driver behind me was riding my bumper? What did I feel when I stopped at the gas station and the automatic pump did not shut off and the side of the car was covered in gas? What did I feel when I got to the office and found that the project I was working on had to be completed in three days when I thought I had another two weeks? Write down your feelings in the notepad and a word or two to help you remember the event corresponding to the feeling. Your list may look like this. Event. Tailgater, gas station, work project due in three days. Feelings, angry, very upset, frustrated and anxious. Do that exercise three times a day and you will develop an awareness of your emotional nature. Using your notepad, communicate your emotions and the events briefly with your spouse as many days as possible. In a few weeks, you will become comfortable expressing your emotions with him or her. And eventually you will feel comfortable discussing your emotions toward your spouse, the children, and events that occur within the home. Remember, emotions themselves are neither good nor bad. They are simply our psychological responses to the events of life. Based on our thoughts and emotions, we eventually make decisions. When the tailgater was following you on the highway and you felt angry, perhaps you had these thoughts, I wish he would lay off, I wish he would pass me, if I thought I wouldn't get caught, I press the accelerator and leave him in the twilight, I should slam on my brakes and let his insurance company buy me a new car, maybe I'll pull off the road and let him pass. Eventually, you made some decision or the other driver backed off, turned, or passed you, and you arrived safely at work. In each of life's events, we have emotions, thoughts, desires, and eventually actions. It is the expression of that process that we call self-revelation. If you choose to learn the love dialect of quality conversation, that is the learning road you must follow. Dead Seas and Babbling Brooks Not all of us are out of touch with our emotions, but when it comes to talking, all of us are affected by our personality. I have observed two basic personality types. The first I call the Dead Sea. In the little nation of Israel, the Sea of Galilee flows south by way of the Jordan River into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea goes nowhere. It receives but it does not give. This personality type receives many experiences, emotions, and thoughts throughout the day. They have a large reservoir where they store that information, and they are perfectly happy not to talk. If you say to a Dead Sea personality, what's wrong? Why aren't you talking tonight? He will probably answer, nothing's wrong. What makes you think something's wrong? And that response is perfectly honest. He is content not to talk. He could drive from Chicago to Detroit and never say a word and be perfectly happy. On the other extreme is the babbling brook. For this personality, whatever enters into the eye gate or the ear gate comes out the mouth gate and there are seldom 60 seconds between the two. Whatever they see, whatever they hear, they tell. 
In fact, if no one is at home to talk to, they will call someone else. Do you know what I saw? Do you know what I heard? If they can't get someone on the telephone, they may talk to themselves because they have no reservoir. Many times a dead sea marries a babbling brook. That happens because when they are dating, it is a very attractive match. If you are a dead sea and you date a babbling brook, you will have a wonderful evening. You don't have to think, how will I get the conversation started tonight? How will I keep the conversation flowing? In fact, you don't have to think at all. All you have to do is nod your head and say, aha, uh -huh, and she will fill up the whole evening and you will go home saying, what a wonderful person. On the other hand, if you are a babbling brook and you date a dead sea, you will have an equally wonderful evening because dead seas are the world's best listeners. You will babble for three hours. He will listen intently to you, and you will go home saying, what a wonderful person. You attract each other. But five years after marriage, the babbling brook wakes up one morning and says, we've been married five years, and I don't know him. The Dead Sea is saying, I know her too well. I wish she would stop the flow and give me a break. The good news is that Dead Seas can learn to talk and babbling brooks can learn to listen. We are influenced by our personality but not controlled by it. One way to learn new patterns is to establish a daily sharing time in which each of you will talk about three things that happened to you that day and how you feel about them. I call that the minimum daily requirement for a healthy marriage. If you will start with the daily minimum, in a few weeks or months you may find quality conversation flowing more freely between you. Quality activities. In addition to the basic love language of quality time, or giving your spouse your undivided attention, there is another dialect called quality activities. At a recent marriage seminar, I asked couples to complete the following sentence, I feel most loved by my husband slash wife when underscore 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 Here is the response of a 29-year-old husband who has been married for eight years, I feel most loved by my wife when we do things together, things I like to do and things she likes to do. We talk more. It sort of feels like we are dating again. That is a typical response of individuals whose primary love language is quality time. The emphasis is on being together, doing things together, giving each other undivided attention. Quality activities may include anything in which one or both of you have an interest. The emphasis is not on what you are doing but on why you are doing it. The purpose is to experience something together, to walk away from it feeling he cares about me. He was willing to do something with me that I enjoy, and he did it with a positive attitude. That is love, and for some people it is love's loudest voice. One of Emily's favorite pastimes is browsing in bookshops, from sprawling superstores to hole-in-the-wall used book dealers. Husband Jeff, less of an avid reader, has learned to share these experiences with Emily and even point out books she may enjoy. Emily, for her part, has learned to compromise and not force Jeff to spend hours in the stacks. As a result, Jeff proudly says, I vowed early on that if there was a book Emily wanted, I would buy it for her. Jeff may never become a bookworm, but he has become proficient at loving Emily. Quality activities may include such things as putting in a garden, visiting historic neighborhoods, shopping for antiques, going to a concert, taking long walks, or having another couple over for homemade soup and bread. The activities are limited only by your interest and willingness to try new experiences. The essential ingredients in a quality activity are, 1. At least one of you wants to do it, 2. The other is willing to do it, and, 3. Both of you know why you are doing it, to express love by being together. One of the byproducts of quality activities is that they provide a memory bank from which to draw in the years ahead. Fortunate is the couple who remembers an early morning stroll along the coast, the spring they planted the flower garden, the time they got poison ivy chasing the rabbit through the woods, the night they attended their first major league baseball game together, the one and only time they went skiing together and he broke his leg, the amusement parks, the concerts, the cathedrals, and oh yes, the awe of standing beneath the waterfall after the two-mile hike. They can almost feel the mist as they remember. Those are memories of love, especially for the person whose primary love language is quality time. And where do we find time for such activities, especially if both of us have vocations outside the home? We make time just as we make time for lunch and dinner. Why? Because it is just as essential to our marriage as meals are to our health. Is it difficult? Does it take careful planning? Yes. Does it mean we have to give up some individual activities? Perhaps. 
does it mean we do some things we don't particularly enjoy? Certainly. Is it worth it? Without a doubt. What's in it for me? The pleasure of living with a spouse who feels loved and knowing that I have learned to speak his or her love language fluently. A personal word of thanks to Bill and Betty Jo in Little Rock, who taught me the value of love language number one, words of affirmation, and love language number two, quality time. Now it's on to Chicago and love language number three. Your turn. What in your marriage detracts from spending quality time? 1. Take a walk together through the old neighborhood where one of you grew up. Ask questions about your spouse's childhood. Ask, what are the fun memories of your childhood? Then, what was most painful about your childhood? 2. Go to the city park and rent bicycles. Ride until you are tired, then sit and watch the ducks. When you get tired of the quacks, roll onto the rose garden. Learn each other's favorite color of rose and why. 3. Ask your spouse for a list of five activities that he would enjoy doing with you. Make plans to do one of them each month for the next five months. If money is a problem, space the freebies between the we can't afford this events. 4. Ask your spouse where she most enjoys sitting when talking with you. The next week, text her one afternoon and say, I want to make a date with you one evening this week to sit on the porch and talk. Which night and what time would be best for you? 5. Think of an activity your spouse enjoys, but which brings little pleasure to you, NASCAR, browsing in flea markets, working out. Tell your spouse that you are trying to broaden your horizons and would like to join him in this activity sometime this month. Set a date and give it your best effort. 6. Plan a weekend getaway just for the two of you sometime within the next six months. Be sure it is a weekend when you won't have to call the office or have a commitment with your kids. Focus on relaxing together doing what one or both of you enjoy. 7. Make time every day to share with each other some of the events of the day. When you spend more time on Facebook than you do listening to each other, you can end up more concerned about your hundred friends than about your spouse. 8. Have a let's review our history evening once every three months. Set aside an hour to focus on your history. Select five questions each of you will answer, such as. 1. Who was your best and worst teacher in school and why? 2. When did you feel your parents were proud of you? 3. What is the worst mistake your mother ever made? 4. What is the worst mistake your father ever made? 5. What do you remember about the religious aspect of your childhood? Each evening, agree on your five questions before you begin your sharing. At the end of the five questions, stop and decide on the five questions you will ask next time. 9. Camp out in the living room. Spread your blankets and pillows on the floor. Get your Pepsi and popcorn. Pretend the TV is broken and talk like you used to when you were dating. Talk till the sun comes up or something else happens. If the floor gets too hard, go back upstairs and go to bed. You won't forget this evening. Chapter 6 Love Language Number 3 Receiving Gifts I was in Chicago when I studied anthropology. By means of detailed ethnographies, printed descriptions of a particular culture, I visited fascinating peoples all over the world. I went to Central America and studied the advanced cultures of the Mayans and the Aztecs. I crossed the Pacific and studied the tribal peoples of Melanesia and Polynesia. I studied the Eskimos of the northern tundra and the aboriginal Ainus of Japan. I examined the cultural patterns surrounding love and marriage and found that in every culture I studied, gift-giving was a part of the love-marriage process. Anthropologists are intrigued by cultural patterns that tend to pervade cultures, and so was I. Could it be that gift-giving is a fundamental expression of love that transcends cultural barriers? Is the attitude of love always accompanied by the concept of giving? Those are academic and somewhat philosophical questions, but if the answer is yes, it has profound practical implications for North American couples. Juice for you. I took an anthropology field trip to the island of Dominica. Our purpose was to study the culture of the Carib Indians, and on the trip I met Fred. Fred was not a Carib but a young black man of 28 years. Fred had lost a hand in a fishing by dynamite accident. Since the accident, he could not continue his fishing career. He had plenty of available time, and I welcomed his companionship. We spent hours together talking about his culture. Upon my first visit to Fred's house, he said to me, Mr. Gary, would you like to have some juice, to which I responded enthusiastically. 
he turned to his younger brother and said, go get Mr. Gary some juice. His brother turned, walked down the dirt path, climbed a coconut tree, and returned with a green coconut. Open it, Fred commanded. With three swift movements of the machete, his brother uncorked the coconut, leaving a triangular hole at the top. Fred handed me the coconut and said, juice for you. It was green, but I drank it, all of it, because I knew it was a gift of love. I was his friend, and to friends you give juice. At the end of our weeks together as I prepared to leave that small island, Fred gave me a final token of his love. It was a crooked stick fourteen inches in length that he had taken from the ocean. It was silky smooth from pounding upon the rocks. Fred said that the stick had lived on the shores of Dominica for a long time, and he wanted me to have it as a reminder of the beautiful island. Even today when I look at that stick, I can almost hear the sound of the Caribbean waves, but it is not as much a reminder of Dominica as it is a reminder of love. A gift is something you can hold in your hand and say, look, he was thinking of me, or, she remembered me. You must be thinking of someone to give him a gift. The gift itself is a symbol of that thought. It doesn't matter whether it costs money. What is important is that you thought of him. And it is not the thought implanted only in the mind that counts, but the thought expressed in actually securing the gift and giving it as the expression of love. Mothers remember the days their children bring a flower from the yard as a gift. They feel loved, even if it was a flower they didn't want picked. From early years, children are inclined to give gifts to their parents, which may be another indication that gift-giving is fundamental to love. Gifts are visual symbols of love. Most wedding ceremonies include the giving and receiving of rings. The person performing the ceremony says, these rings are outward and visible signs of an inward and spiritual bond that unites your two hearts in love that has no end. That is not meaningless rhetoric. It is verbalizing a significant truth, symbols have emotional value, perhaps that is even more graphically displayed near the end of a disintegrating marriage when the husband or wife stops wearing the wedding ring. It is a visual sign that the marriage is in serious trouble. One husband said, when she threw her wedding rings at me and angrily walked out of the house slamming the door behind her, I knew our marriage was in serious trouble. I didn't pick up her rings for two days. When I finally did, I cried. The rings were a symbol of what should have been, but lying in his hand and not on her finger. They were visual reminders that the marriage was falling apart. The lonely ring stirred deep emotions within the husband. Visual symbols of love are more important to some people than to others. That's why individuals have different attitudes toward wedding rings. Some never take the ring off after the wedding. Others don't even wear a wedding band. That is another sign that people have different primary love languages. If receiving gifts is my primary love language, I will place great value on the ring you have given me and I will wear it with great pride. I will also be greatly moved emotionally by other gifts that you give through the years. I will see them as expressions of love. Without gifts as visual symbols, I may question your love. Gifts come in all sizes, colors, and shapes. Some are expensive, and others are free. To the individual whose primary love language is receiving gifts, the cost of the gift will matter little, unless it is greatly out of line with what you can afford. If a millionaire gives only one dollar gifts regularly, the spouse may question whether that is an expression of love, but when family finances are limited, a one dollar gift may speak a million dollars worth of love. Gifts may be purchased, found, or made. The husband who finds an interesting bird feather while out jogging and brings it home to his wife has found himself an expression of love, unless, of course, his wife is allergic to feathers. For the men who can afford it, you can purchase a beautiful card for less than $5. For the men who cannot, you can make one for free. Get the paper out of the trash can where you work, fold it in the middle, take scissors and cut out a heart. Write, I love you, and sign your name. Gifts need not be expensive. But what of the person who says, I'm not a gift giver? I didn't receive many gifts growing up. I never learned how to select gifts. It doesn't come naturally for me. Congratulations, you have just made the first discovery in becoming a great lover. You and your spouse speak different love languages. Now that you have made that discovery, get on with the business of learning your second language. If your spouse's primary love language is receiving gifts, you can become a proficient gift giver. In fact, it is one of the easiest love languages to learn. Where do you begin? Make a list of all the gifts your spouse has expressed excitement about receiving through the years. They may be gifts you have given or gifts given by other family members or friends. 
the list will give you an idea of the kind of gifts your spouse would enjoy receiving. If you have little or no knowledge about selecting the kinds of gifts on your list, recruit the help of family members who know your spouse. In the meantime, select gifts that you feel comfortable purchasing, making, or finding, and give them to your spouse. Don't wait for a special occasion. If receiving gifts is his, her primary love language, almost anything you give will be received as an expression of love. If she has been critical of your gifts in the past and almost nothing you have given has been acceptable, then receiving gifts is almost certainly not her primary love language. The Best Investment If you are to become an effective gift giver, you may have to change your attitude about money. Each of us has an individualized perception of the purposes of money, and we have various emotions associated with spending it. Some of us have a spending orientation. We feel good about ourselves when we are spending money. Others have a saving and investing perspective. We feel good about ourselves when we are saving money and investing it wisely. If you are a spender, you will have little difficulty purchasing gifts for your spouse, but if you are a saver, you will experience emotional resistance to the idea of spending money as an expression of love. You don't purchase things for yourself, why should you purchase things for your spouse, but that attitude fails to recognize that you are purchasing things for yourself. By saving and investing money you are purchasing self-worth and emotional security. You are caring for your own emotional needs in the way you handle money. What you are not doing is meeting the emotional needs of your spouse. If you discover that your spouse's primary love language is receiving gifts, then perhaps you will understand that purchasing gifts for him or her is the best investment you can make. You are investing in your relationship and filling your spouse's emotional love tank, and with a full love tank, he or she will likely reciprocate emotional love to you in a language you will understand. When both persons' emotional needs are met, your marriage will take on a whole new dimension. Don't worry about your savings. You will always be a saver, but to invest in loving your spouse is to invest in blue chip stocks. The gift of self. There is an intangible gift that sometimes speaks more loudly than a gift that can be held in one's hand. I call it the gift of self or the gift of presence. Being there when your spouse needs you speaks loudly to the one whose primary love language is receiving gifts. Jen once said to me, my husband, Don, loves softball more than he loves me. Why do you say that? I inquired. On the day our baby was born, he played softball. I was lying in the hospital all afternoon while he played softball, she said. Was he there when the baby was born? Oh, yes. He stayed long enough for the baby to be born, but ten minutes afterward, he left to play softball. I was devastated. It was such an important moment in our lives. I wanted us to share it together. I wanted him to be there with me. Don deserted me to play. That husband may have sent her a dozen roses, but they would not have spoken as loudly as his presence in the hospital room beside her. I could tell that Jen was deeply hurt by that experience. The baby was now fifteen years old and she was talking about the event with all the emotion as though it had happened yesterday. I probed further. Have you based your conclusion that Don loves softball more than he loves you on this one experience? No, she said. On the day of my mother's funeral, he also played softball. Did he go to the funeral? Yes, he did. He went to the funeral, but as soon as it was over, he left to play softball. I couldn't believe it. My brothers and sisters came to the house with me, but my husband was playing softball. Later I asked Don about those two events, he knew exactly what I was talking about. I knew she would bring that up, he said. I was there through all the labor and when the baby was born. I took pictures, I was so happy. I couldn't wait to tell the guys on the team, but my bubble was burst when I got back to the hospital that evening. She was furious with me. I couldn't believe what she was saying. I thought she would be proud of me for telling the team. And when her mother died, she probably did not tell you that I took off work a week before she died and spent the whole week at the hospital and at her mother's house doing repairs and helping out. After she died and the funeral was over, I felt I had done all I could do. I needed a breather. I liked to play softball, and I knew that would help me relax and relieve some of the stress I'd been under. I thought she would want me to take a break. I had done what I thought was important to her, but it wasn't enough. She has never let me forget those two days, she says that I love softball more than I love her. That's ridiculous. He was a sincere husband who failed to understand the tremendous power of presence. His being there for his wife was more important than anything else in her mind. 
Physical presence in the time of crisis is the most powerful gift you can give if your spouse's primary love language is receiving gifts. Your body becomes the symbol of your love. Remove the symbol, and the sense of love evaporates. In counseling, Don and Jan worked through the hurts and misunderstandings of the past. Eventually, Jan was able to forgive him, and Don came to understand why his presence was so important to her. If the physical presence of your spouse is important to you, I urge you to verbalize that to your spouse. Don't expect him to read your mind. If, on the other hand, your spouse says to you, I really want you to be there with me tonight, tomorrow, this afternoon, take his request seriously. From your perspective, it may not be important, but if you are not responsive to that request, you may be communicating a message you do not intend. A husband once said, when my mother died, my wife's supervisor said that she could be off two hours for the funeral but she needed to be back in the office for the afternoon. My wife told him that she felt her husband needed her support that day and she would have to be away the entire day. The supervisor replied, if you are gone all day, you may well lose your job. My wife said, my husband is more important than my job. She spent the day with me. Somehow that day, I felt more loved by her than ever before. I have never forgotten what she did. Incidentally, he said, she didn't lose her job. Her supervisor soon left, and she was asked to take his job. That wife had spoken the love language of her husband, and he never forgot it. Miracle in Chicago Almost everything ever written on the subject of love indicates that at the heart of love is the spirit of giving. All five love languages challenge us to give to our spouse, but for some, receiving gifts, visible symbols of love, speaks the loudest. I heard the most graphic illustration of that truth in Chicago, where I met Doug and Kate. They attended my marriage seminar and agreed to take me to O'Hare Airport after the seminar on Saturday afternoon. We had two or three hours before my flight, and they asked if I would like to stop at a restaurant. I was famished, so I readily assented. Kate began talking almost immediately after we sat down. She said, Dr. Chapman, God used you to perform a miracle in our marriage. Three years ago, we attended your marriage seminar here in Chicago for the first time. I was desperate, she said. I was thinking seriously of leaving Doug and had told him so. Our marriage had been empty for a long time. I had given up. For years, I had complained to Doug that I needed his love, but he never responded. I loved the children, and I knew they loved me, but I felt nothing coming from Doug. In fact, by that time, I hated him. He was a methodical person. He did everything by routine. He was as predictable as a clock, and no one could break into his routine. For years, she continued, I tried to be a good wife. I did all the things I thought a good wife should do. I had sex with him because I knew that was important to him, but I felt no love coming from him. I felt like he stopped dating me after we got married and simply took me for granted. I felt used and unappreciated. When I talked to Doug about my feelings, he'd laugh at me and say we had as good a marriage as anybody else in the community. He didn't understand why I was so unhappy. He would remind me that the bills were paid, that we had a nice house and a new car, that I was free to work or not work outside the home and that I should be happy instead of complaining all the time. He didn't even try to understand my feelings. I felt totally rejected. Well, anyway, she said as she moved her tea and leaned forward, we came to your seminar three years ago. I did not know what to expect, and frankly I didn't expect much. I didn't think anybody could change Doug. During and after the seminar, he didn't say too much. He seemed to like it. He said that you were funny, but he didn't talk with me about any of the ideas in the seminar. I didn't expect him to, and I didn't ask him to. Then that Monday afternoon, he came home from work and gave me a rose. Where did you get that? I asked. I bought it from a street vendor, he said. I thought you deserved a rose. I started crying. Oh, Doug, that is so sweet of you. On Tuesday he called me from the office at about 1.30 and asked me what I thought about his buying a pizza and bringing it home for dinner. He said he thought I might enjoy a break from cooking dinner. I told him I thought the idea was wonderful, and so he brought home a pizza and we had a fun time together. The children loved the pizza and thanked their father for bringing it. I actually gave him a hug and told him how much I enjoyed it. When he came home on Wednesday, he brought each of the children a box of Cracker Jacks, and he had a small potted plant for me. He said he knew the rose would die, and he thought I might like something that would be around for a while. I was beginning to think I was hallucinating. 
I couldn't believe what Doug was doing or why he was doing it. Thursday night after dinner, he handed me a card with a message about his not always being able to express his love to me but hoping that the card would communicate how much he cared. Why don't we get a babysitter on Saturday night and the two of us go out for dinner, he suggested. That would be wonderful, I said. On Friday afternoon, he stopped by the cookie shop and bought each of us one of our favorite cookies. Again, he kept it as a surprise, telling us only that he had a treat for dessert. By Saturday night, she said, I was in orbit. I had no idea what had come over Doug, or if it would last, but I was enjoying every minute of it. After our dinner at the restaurant, I said to him, Doug, you have to tell me what's happening. I don't understand. She looked at me intently and said, Dr. Chapman, you have to understand. This man had never given me a flower since the day we got married, he never gave me a card for any occasion. He always said, it's a waste of money, you look at the card and throw it away. We'd been out to dinner one time in five years. He never bought the children anything and expected me to buy only the essentials. He had never brought a pizza home for dinner. He expected me to have dinner ready every night. I mean, this was a radical change in his behavior. I turned to Doug and asked, what did you say to her in the restaurant when she asked you what was going on? I told her that I had listened to your lecture on love languages at the seminar and that I realized that her love language was gifts. I also realized that I had not given her a gift in years, maybe not since we had been married. I remembered that when we were dating I used to bring her flowers and other small gifts, but after marriage I figured we couldn't afford that. I told her that I had decided that I was going to try to get her a gift every day for one week and see if it made any difference in her. I had to admit that I had seen a pretty big difference in her attitude during the week. I told her that I realized that what you said was really true and that learning the right love language was the key to helping another person feel loved. I said I was sorry that I had been so dense for all those years and had failed to meet her need for love. I told her that I really loved her and that I appreciated all the things she did for me and the children. I told her that with God's help, I was going to be a gift giver for the rest of my life. She said, but, Doug, you can't go on buying me gifts every day for the rest of your life. You can't afford that. Well, maybe not every day, I said, but at least once a week. That would be 52 more gifts per year than what you have received in the past five years. I continued, and who said I was going to buy all of them. I might even make some of them, or I'll take Dr. Chapman's idea and pick a free flower from the front yard in the spring. I don't think he has missed a single week in three years, Kate said. He is like a new man, you wouldn't believe how happy we have been. Our children call us lovebirds now. My tank is full and overflowing. I turned to Doug and asked, but what about you, Doug? Do you feel loved by Kate? Oh, I've always felt loved by her, Dr. Chapman. She is the best housekeeper in the world. She is an excellent cook. She is wonderful about doing things for the children. I know she loves me. He smiled and said, now you know what my love language is, don't you? I did, and I also knew why Kate had used the word miracle. Gifts need not be expensive, nor must they be given weekly. But for some individuals, their worth has nothing to do with monetary value and everything to do with love. Your turn. Reflect on ways to give gifts to one another even if finances are tight. 1. Try a parade of gifts. Leave a box of candy for your spouse in the morning, have flowers delivered in the afternoon, give him a gift in the evening. When your spouse asks, what is going on, you respond, just trying to fill your love tank. 2. Let nature be your guide. The next time you take a walk through the neighborhood, keep your eyes open for a gift for your spouse. It may be a stone, a stick, or a feather. You may even attach special meaning to your natural gift. For example, a smooth stone may symbolize your marriage with many of the rough places now polished. A feather may symbolize how your spouse is the wind beneath your wings. 3. Discover the value of handmade originals. Make a gift for your spouse. This may require you to enroll in a class, ceramics, silversmithing, painting, wood carving, etc. Your main purpose for enrolling is to make your spouse a gift. A handmade gift often becomes a family heirloom. 4. Give your spouse a gift every day for one week. It need not be a special week, just any week. I promise you it will become the week that was. If you are really energetic, you can make it the month that was. No, your spouse will not expect you to keep this up for a lifetime. 5. Keep a gift idea notebook. 
Every time you hear your spouse say, I really like that, write it down in your notebook. Listen carefully and you will get quite a list. This will serve as a guide when you get ready to select a gift. To prime the pump, you could look through a favorite online shopping site together. 6. Enlist a personal shopper. If you really don't have a clue as to how to select a gift for your spouse, ask a friend or family member who knows your wife or husband well to help you. Most people enjoy making a friend happy by getting them a gift, especially if it is with your money. 7. Offer the gift of presents. Say to your spouse, I want to offer the gift of my presents at any event or on any occasion you would like this month. You tell me when, and I will make every effort to be there. Get ready. Be positive. Who knows, you may enjoy the symphony or the hockey game. 8. Give your spouse a book and agree to read it yourself. Then offer to discuss together a chapter each week. Don't choose a book that you want him or her to read. Choose a book on a topic in which you know your spouse has an interest, sex, football, needlework, money management, child rearing, religion, backpacking. 9. Give a lasting tribute. Give a gift to your spouse's church or favorite charity in honor of her birthday your anniversary, or another occasion. Ask the charity to send a card informing your spouse of what you have done. The church or charity will be excited and so will your spouse. 10. Give a living gift. Purchase and plant a tree or flowering shrub in honor of your spouse. You may plant it in your own yard, where you can water and nurture it, or with permission in a public park or forest where others can also enjoy it. You will get credit for this one year after year.